I'm going to turn. Uh, for those of you who are new here and you're going, these guys, they sung like a lot of songs about the blood. What is up with that? I just want to kind of let you in on something. The, the scripture tells us that there is, uh, life is found in the blood. And so when we talk about finding life, we're talking about finding life in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, the blood that he shed. And so we believe that stuff, that he has made a difference. His death on the cross has made a difference for us. And I want you to know that was a war. That was a battle. He won the war right there when he died on the cross. All the men in here love good battle stories. I mean, you love watching the shows about battle, whether it's the Patriot, huh? Yeah, come on. Gladiator. I mean, you're all about that. How about uh, William Wallace and Braveheart? Yes. Ladies, you're not necessarily going, hey, find me a good war movie. <laughs> Band of Brothers. I mean, like, you're not looking for that. But when you watch it and you see it, one of the things that really is gripping for all of us, it's people who are living for something that is greater than themselves. They're living for something greater than themselves. There's a picture that they're going to put on the screen. I want you to see this picture. It's, it's, been, it's been said it is the most reproduced. It is the most reproduced picture ever. Uh, now, uh, this is a picture happened in February of 1945. This, these are the Marines who went up on Mount Suribachi and the war was happening all around them. It's the highest point in Japan. They went in. Remember, this happened after the, battle, uh, after the, the attack of Pearl Harbor, Harbor. This is still several years later. They plant the flag. And while they're planting the flag, if you read some of the history around it, there are people still shooting. Bombs are going off. People, but they are planting the flag. Do you realize that the war was not over here? There were still battles that had to take place all across the European theater, uh, uh, everywhere around. But what this did, many historians say that this picture, when it was shown around the world, specifically in the United States, it gave people hope. Yes, we can move forward. Do you realize that there are some folks who would say that this picture was instrumental in the, in the U.S. continuing on and actually winning? That's, many people would say that. Here's what I want you to catch. These, these guys gave their lives. They, there's a reason that we have Memorial Day, all right? There's a reason that we do that because people have laid their life down. It cost them something. I need you to hear this really quick. We're about to look at Revelation chapter 12. So if you've got your Bibles, open up to Revelation chapter 12. And I need you to hear something. A war has already gone on and it has been won. There was, a, there was blood that was spilled on Calvary for us to win that war. And I need you to hear me. We didn't win it. It was really Jesus that won that war. We get in on it and we win because we've surrendered our lives to Jesus as Lord and Savior. But the battle still rages on. And listen, there, there are spiritual arrows, spiritual bullets, spiritual darts, that are still being flying around you. You're still in a battle every day. And the deal is, is that we end up thinking that it is politics and presidents and professors and it's other people, it's systematic this and it's color of this and it's gender of that. And I need you to hear me, all those things are real. But more than that, the scripture tells us that our battle is not with flesh and blood. It's with spirit. So what we're facing today is a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. But as those of us who have surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ, you need to hear me. I want you to, I want you to be real clear. I want to make sure that you hear this. You've already won. The battle's not over. You've still got to walk through that. But there is hope today. You know why there is hope today? Because the war was won when Jesus died on the cross. The war was won when he came out of the grave. And so today, if you're not a follower of Christ, I want you to know you've been prayed for. This morning at 7.30, we were spread out all over this auditorium praying that you would be here. And that the Lord would open your eyes to see. So with that, let's start reading. 
Let's start reading. Revelation chapter 12. Uh, last week you were introduced that this battle was happening, that there was a woman. This woman symbolically represents the church, who, uh, the one through which all of the believing community, those of the Old Testament and then the church that we came from, that there is an enemy, a great dragon. You're going to see, again, who that dragon is as we begin to read. And now then you're going to see the war that's happening, where the curtain is pulled back a little bit. So beginning in verse 7, and I'm going to follow all the way down, and I'm going to read the passage in entirety. Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 17. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. You remember me always saying, listen, you need to make sure, and when you see things repeated, that's thrown down like three different times. That's big, all right? Underline that, circle that was thrown down with him, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the glory, excuse me, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God, verse 11. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb And by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath. Because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, but the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly away from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth. The earth opens its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Verse 17, then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring and on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. That's the word of the Lord. I'm going to give you a little bit of a picture here, all right, of where we're headed so that you know. Today, we're going to focus in on one verse. We're going to focus in on Revelation Chapter 12, verse 11, probably one of my all-time favorite verses in all the scripture. And we're going to see today, the roadmap is, is that we have the ability to conquer. We conquer. We don't do the conquering. It's only through Christ. But notice how we conquer through Christ. It's by, number one, Christians conquer by the blood of the lamb. Number two, Christians conquer by the power of their testimony. And then number three, Christians conquer by loving God more than their life. And I hope that you wrote those down. As you didn't, we're gonna, you're going to hear them again. We're going to keep moving through. Notice in verse 7, we're going to start with how Christians conquer through the blood of the Lamb. Uh, notice in verse 7, it says that there is a war that has broken out in heaven between the devil and his angels and Michael, the archangel, who, and his angels. So who is this and what is this? Well, in Daniel chapter 12, Remember, when you're reading the, the re- book of Revelation, you got to go back to Dan- you got to go back to the Old Testament, and we've been in Daniel a lot. In Daniel chapter twelve, you're introduced, or I say introduced, you see Michael, the archangel, and what we see there is that he's in a battle, and he's talking about a battle that is to come, and he is in a battle with the forces of evil, the forces of darkness. Many people, we would point to this being the battle. Now, some who would read this, they would say, listen, this is pointing to a battle that's going to happen immediately before the rapture. When Jesus comes, he's going to pull his church out. That's how they would read that. I read this a little differently. I read this from the standpoint that this battle has already taken place. This battle has already happened, all right? As Jesus walked the earth, Michael and his the archangel, they're doing battle with Satan. While Jesus is doing battle on the earth, there is a battle happening in heaven. 
Jesus, the scripture tells us, came, lived a perfect life. He died a death on the cross. He was put in a grave. And it said on the third day, he arose from the grave. Do you remember at Easter time, those of you who have been with us, and we talked about how important Easter is. It's not just his death. There's been many people that have died. There's only been one who's been resurrected. And his resurrection secured the battle. This is where the defeat, this is where Satan and his minions, this is where the great deceiver, this is where Satan, the liar, Satan, the deceiver, Satan, the adversary, the one who is a roaming, who, who, who wants to devour you like a roaming lion, like a roaring lion. This is where I would say he's been kicked out. He's been thrown down. The battle has been won. There is no more. And now, and now what is that though? Somehow as you're reading this and as you look through the Old Testament, it, it gives us the understanding that Satan had access to the throne room. So I don't, I don't think that thrown down means that he had like this heavenly penthouse, he got evicted and he can no longer go back. I think what it is telling us here is that he has no longer access to the throne room. Do you remember what we, if you're taking some notes, I want you to write this down. Remember, the, the word devil means liar and accuser. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, verse 15 tells us that the dragon poured water out of his mouth in an attempt to sweep the woman away. The believing community, sweep the woman away. Here's what we know. In Revelation, the mouth is symbolic. And whatever comes out of someone's mouth, do you remember when, when it speaks about Jesus, the words that come from his mouth? They're like a double-edged sword. What, what proceeds from the mouth of God? His word. So what you're seeing here, this liar, this devil, the scripture identifies in verse nine. Verse nine says this ancient serpent, this great dragon is the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. Devil meaning liar and deceiver. Do you know what the Satan's always been about? What the devil's always been about? Lying to us. He's been about lying to us. From the very beginning, do you remember what happened in Genesis chapter three? He looked at Eve and do you remember what he said to Eve? Did God really say that? Did he really mean that? Or is that what he was trying to do? Listen, do you know that he's still about that today? He's still about lying to you and deceiving you. From the very beginning, when he did that in Genesis three, all the way through, he's been, looked at Job. Even into the new church, when you get to the, the ancient church, you begin to see he has been about lying and deceiving and false teaching. In the New Testament, you re, there's a, a heresy that comes up called Gnosticism. And that Gnosticism is, is, Gnosticism is, is a secret wisdom, a secret knowledge. And all throughout the New Testament, Paul combats that. It, into the early days of the 100s, the 200s, the 300s, uh, and there was a, 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 a church father named Arian who rose up to say that Jesus, listen, he, he's not always been eternal. He was a created being. Pelagian rose up, Pelagianism. He rose up to say, uh, Jesus, listen, uh, man is born uh, righteous, we're born without sin. We know that the scripture says man was born a sinner. We, we were born wicked and evil because of our first parents, Adam and Eve. We didn't, we weren't born holy and righteous and then sin. No, we were born wicked and evil and we have sinned since then. But not only that, you've got Mormonism, you've got Jehovah's Witness, you've got Scientology, you've got whatever. I, you need to hear me. The, Satan is using the devil, the liar. He's trying to deceive us. And you, we know he's been about deceiving people from day one. He's been about deceiving people. But even today, you know what bothers me? Is there are people within the church false teachers who are lying to people today. They were saying things like, 
you know what, if you give enough money, if you give enough money, if you sow a seed, God's going to bless you. In fact, he'll owe you. There are those in the church today who will say, listen, if you have enough faith, God will heal you. What does that speak to all these others of the Old Testament, to the Scriptures? There are those who would look, who would say, listen, your salvation, it depends on all that you do, that you do enough good works. But we know that's not what the Scripture is trying to say. Listen, uh, but it's not enough that he just tries to confuse you, that he wants to lie to you, that he wants to deceive you. I want you to know he wants to accuse you also. And the Scripture leads us to see in the Old Testament that in Job, we know that he did go before God and say, God, listen, have you, what about Job? He, listen, he only follows you because you protect him. You've given him all this stuff. You've not harmed him. And God said, listen, you can, you can come after him, but you cannot take his life. And what we know that what ended up happening, possessions and family, his illness struck his body. But there's Job coming before God. You see, before Christ died on the cross, he had access to the throne room to stand and accuse. He could accuse Moses. <laughs> Moses? What you, he murdered somebody. What do you, God, what, he's murdered somebody. David, he could accuse David. Uh, what do you mean, God, he is a man after your own heart? What about Bathsheba? What about murdering Bathsheba's husband? He could walk through this person and this person and this person. But I need you to hear this. When Jesus died on the cross, when he shed his blood, when he was laid in a tomb, when he arose from the grave, I need you to hear this. There was no more accusation. He could no longer have access. The scripture tells us here how many times he has been thrown out. He's been thrown down. The war had been won. Michael and his angels cast them out. He, when did that happen? When Jesus rose from the grave. There is no more accusing God, accu accusing you before God because he has no more access. But you know what he does now? He comes to us and he continues the ancient lies that he's always been. And he begins to accuse God to you. Did God really say that? Did, did God really say that? Does, does God really have parameters for your sex life? I mean, did Jesus speak that? Listen, did God really mean that you can have sex with anybody you want to whenever you want to have them? He's holding out on you. Listen, you, he didn't know what he's talking about. And you know what ends up happening? People buy the lie. They buy it. What do you mean? Did God really say that we're to honor him with the first fruits of our tithes and our offerings? Listen, if you do that, you won't be able to get those things that you really desire. And you know what? You deserve that. You deserve it. You see, he is constantly lying to us. He is constantly giving a flood of lies, a flood of accusations to each of us because he has no, he, he can't accuse us anymore before God because when he does, when he comes before, Jesus says, listen, shut up. You get out. He's with me. My blood has paid for that one. So he comes and he, lies to us. He accuses God that God's, God's word really doesn't say that. You, you, you don't have to trust that. But then he comes to you, and I think one of the worst things that happened, not, listen, yes, accusing us that God's word is not true. But we, as followers of Jesus, oftentimes we see that. But here's what he does then. He's, he turns it and he begins to accuse you to you. He begins to say, you ain't worthy. You, you say you're a follower of Jesus, but you did this. You, what do you mean? You, you watch pornography. You, you're addicted to this. 
You speak this way. What do you mean? You, uh, you call yourself a follower of Jesus? And you know what ends up happening? We begin to hear that. And we begin to believe that. Folks, I want you to hear this. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you realize that his lies, his accusations of you as a follower of Christ, they only have power if you allow them to have power. When you begin to believe them, it, it is then turning and saying, listen, I have been changed. I have been bought with the blood of Jesus. My life is not my own. Now, I want to make sure that you hear me. There is freedom from your past. You are no longer bound to your past because of the blood of Jesus. And when you begin to believe the lies and the accusations that he brings to you, do you know what you're actually saying? His word overpowers the word of God. Because God says you're forgiven and free. Not because you're good, but because you've come under the blood of Jesus. You've got to realize, how do Christians conquer? Because of the blood of the Lamb. We are under grace with God. Now, listen, that's not giving us the ability to go do whatever we want. Romans 6 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. No. But that enemy, that deceiver, that accuser, that roaring lion, his name is Satan. He comes and he whispers. And many times he begins to shout. Hey, listen, you're bound. You're no good. But I need you to hear me. How do you overcome by the blood of the lamb. He has changed you if you have surrendered your life to him. And you no longer have to believe the lies. You no longer have to listen to the accusations that he is bringing to you. Some of you today as followers of Jesus, you've been living the lie, you've been you've bought the lie, so you've tried to live in the lie. And now then you feel like you are so far away from Jesus, you could never get back. I need you to hear this. He is as close to you as turning around. You know what that's called? Repenting. You see, we don't like to hear that word, but it repenting is turning to Jesus. He will forgive you. And I need you to hear this. He's already forgiven you as a follower of Christ. But we've listened to the lie. And I need you to hear, whatever you're walking in today, if you're walking in fear, you're walking in doubt, you're walking in bondage to an addiction, I need you to hear. Because of the blood of Jesus, you have freedom. Don't buy the lie. Christians conquer. Your chains are not tied to you any longer. You have been set free because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Number two, Christians also conquer by the power of their testimony. This is a perfect place for me to make a turn here quickly. I want you to hear this. Uh, <laughs> Your test, a testimony is a personal story. It's about what you've seen, what you were a part of. Now, you need to hear this. Your testimony is not about, not about how good you are. Your testimony is about how good God is, okay? You've not done anything. I've not done anything to deserve the blood of Jesus. It is a gift of God so that no man can boast. So my testimony, how I overcome, is by proclaiming what God has done, when the enemy comes to lie to me, to accuse me, to cause me to question his word, to say, hey, listen, you're too tired. You don't need to get up today. No, Jesus has changed me. He has bought me. He laid his life down for me. I, you have no power. Jesus, I love you. I'm following after you. Some of you today are going, that sounds weird. That's because you've not lived in that. 
You know what my hope is? My hope is, is that you will tell everyone you know about Life Point Riverdale. That's my hope. But I want you to make it the second thing you tell them. You know what the first thing I want you to tell them is that Jesus has changed my life. Life Point Riverdale is not going to change your life. It's Jesus that will change your life. Your testimony about Jesus is what changes people. And I want you to hear this. Satan, the deceiver, the evil one, the roaring lion, the accuser, the accuser of your soul, he doesn't want anybody to know that he's already been defeated and lost the war. And when you share about how your life has been changed by Jesus Christ, you know what ends up happening? We take back land. <laughs> I mean, seriously. God's kingdom is extended and the rule of the evil one, because he is the prince of the power of the air today. He, th listen, he, you know what he's doing right now? He knows the war's already been won. And you know what he's doing? He's firing shots at you. He's firing shots at you because he knows if I can get you to not live like Christ, if I can get you to doubt your salvation, if I can get you to believe the lie, the accusations, you're not going to tell anybody about Jesus and I'm going to keep on. And listen, that's another one that's gone. Because here's what happens. The enemy's been defeated and you know what he's trying to do right now? He's trying to do exactly what armies that have been defeated and start retreating, they start burning the house down. Scorched earth. He's wanting to defeat you, to steal, to kill your joy. He's wanting to burn the house down. And folks, I need you to hear this. This is exciting to me. You've already won. You've already won. You don't have to believe the lie. You don't have to believe the, the accusation. You know why? Because we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony, not your testimony, about you, but the testimony about God and what he's done in your life. Someone has said before that you're to preach the gospel, and if you need to, use words. No, listen, you can't preach the gospel without words. We need to be doing all kinds of social ministry. We need to, Matthew 25, we need to be giving a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus. We need to be feeding the poor. We need to be helping those, I believe in 25, it talks about the prisoners. You, James talk about, talks about widows and orphans. We need to do all that. But if we do all of that and don't talk about Jesus, you know what it does? It terminates on us and people go, boy, those are good people. It is not about us. It's about Jesus and his blood. It's about him. And so the only way that we overcome is by the blood of the lamb and the testimony that we've been changed by Jesus Christ. Today, if you're feeling defeated, let me tell you something. You start going back to the word. You turn back to Jesus and you start talking about what Jesus has done in your life and how he's changed you. And you know who you start that with? With you. Listen, at my lowest point a few months ago, I was really, really sick. Some of you know this. And I got really, I got pretty depressed during that COVID stuff. I got, I mean, I'm sitting in my chair and I'm thinking, Lord, what's, and all of a sudden, I just felt like the Lord say, just start, just start thanking me. And for the, like the last, I mean, it, I mean, I'm telling you, it was two, three, four hours. I just started from the day I surrendered my life to Christ and I began to say all the things I'm thankful for. And you know what ended up happening? There was, that dark cloud began to rise. And I truly believe that dark cloud was the enemy, the great deceiver, the accuser, the one who was trying his hardest. But it wasn't because of me. It's because of the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony that, God, you are good. You have changed us. Folks, I need you to hear me today. You're free. You're free. The chains are down. Not because of what you've done, but because of Jesus. And the testimony is, is that Jesus has changed you. Notice the last thing quickly. The last thing is this, is that we conquer by the blood of the lamb. We conquer, con conquer by the power of the testimony. But we all, notice it says this also, is that they conquered by loving God more than their own life. More than their own life, it says. 
When John said in verse 11, look at verse 11. When John says that they love not their lives even unto death, do you know what he's making right there? That's a value statement. He is talking about what is valuable to them. And I'm going to ask you right now, have you thought about what's valuable to you? Is it your home, your kids, your wife, your family? Is it your retirement account? Is it this boat you got you're looking for? Is it, what, what is it? The scripture here says the way that they overcame was the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not count their lives. They did not hold on. They were willing to say whatever, God, in light of who you are and what you've done, my hands are open. There is, I've, t- I've said this to you before, so I'm gonna reiterate it. And you know, I'm a repetition guy. So when you start talking about repeating, that means you've seen this, you circle it, you underline it because there's something to it. You need to hear this. Did you realize that in the last 100 years, there have been more people who died for the name of Jesus than in the previous 2000? You see, we think, we think that's old stuff. There are people today in this world who are in prison for the name of Jesus. There are people today who will be attacked because of the name of Jesus. There are people whose home will be burnt because of the name of Jesus. There are people who will be adopted today because of the name of Jesus. And we sit back and we think, you want me to tithe? Are you kidding me? That means, okay, uh, I won't be able to do this. You want me to serve? Wait a minute. I don't know that I have time to do that because you, do you know what my schedule looks like? I need you to hear me. This is why there is an impotent church in the United States. Do you know what's going to make a difference in Riverdale, in Murfreesboro, when we go, man, my life's been changed. Jesus, he's changed me. Mom, if you're a mom out here right now, you know what the greatest Mom's Day gift you could give your kids? It's to follow Jesus with everything you've got. Listen, you may feel like you're giving and giving and giving, but I want you to hear me. If you're not giving them Jesus, you're giving them sawdust. It. Uh, Moms, if you don't know Jesus, would you come to him today? Would you come to him today? There's a book that I want to encourage you to, a little book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. This is all about, that's just a little paperback, easy to read. I paid four bucks for it when I got it. There's the cost right there, four bucks. <laughs> this book right here talks about people from the days of old, when the church first began, and what they went through, their, their lives they laid down, and the shoulders the foundation that we stand upon. But I need you to know, it still goes on today. I've talked to you several times about a ministry called the Voice of the Martyrs. And they send me a magazine. This is what that is. For, for those of you who are young people in here, this is a, a magazine has, <laughs> has pictures. It also, uh, just for you, uh, there's an app, okay? You got, there's a, they have an app. This, is, this magazine comes to me every month and it talks about people who are dying today around the world for the gospel. Folks, I need you to hear me. I'm not asking you to go out and lay your life down. I am going out asking you though to say, listen, today I'm gonna deny myself. I'm going to pick up my cross and I'm going to follow Jesus I'm thankful that it doesn't cost us our lives today. I'm thankful for that. But I'm I'm not a prophet. I'm not a son of a prophet. But I am going to make a prediction. It's going to continue to cost you more and more to follow Jesus. You know, you talk about things that have marked you. My family had the opportunity to go and serve in Europe for a period of time. And I always tell people, I feel like I've been to the future because I believe I have. I've seen the future of where we are headed. And I need you to know 
there are fewer followers of Jesus in that world than there are in our world today. Uh, There are fewer people. In fact, you don't have Christian culture. You don't have people. Listen, Jesus t-shirts and Jesus stations, and they don't exist. Or few and far between. I think I found one Christian radio station that was fuzzy at best on the best day you could get it. But here's what I know. When we met another believer in that country, not city, country, when we met another one, the scripture that talks about that your spirit will bear witness with their spirit, we knew. And folks, I need you to hear me say, this ain't doomsday. I'm not doomsday. I, listen, I, I am a glass overflowing But I need you to know, it's going to begin to cost us to follow Jesus. And the only thing that's going to allow us to overcome is the blood of the lamb being under the sacrifice of Jesus. Oh, the blood. Listen, we're not obsessed with like sacrifices. We're obsessed with one sacrifice, the one of Jesus Christ on the cross. His name, there is no other name under heaven given by which men, women, boys and girls will be saved. And folks, it's going to be by his blood that you stand. It's going to be by your testimony that he has changed your life. Only him. I love my wife. Our lives have changed drastically with one another. But I need you to know, Jesus is the one who paid the price for my soul. And my testimony today is about Jesus. And the question is today, is my life open? Now, this is yours. Is your home open for a new church if one's birthed? Is your home open for a group of people to come and meet and gather? Hey, uh, listen, uh, I've got a brother or a sister in this body. They need a car. I've got an extra car. Listen, uh, I've got children that need to know that Jesus is alive today. I'll go serve. That's what we want Riverdale known for. Not a maniac East Texan preaching, not worship not, we're going to have an awesome VBS, but I don't, want to, I don't want us to be known for VBS. Listen, camp's going to be incredible. It's not big camp. You know what it's about? It's about a body of believers who understand that the only way we're going to make it today is because of the blood of Jesus and when we testify about him and that we're holding loosely to everything because our value is, is that Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. Greater. And some of you right now, that's a challenge for you. I'm all, I'm all right with that. I'm glad I'm asking you to accept the challenge, and we will walk with you. I'm asking you today is that if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, and there's something stirring in you, again, it's not worship, it's not a speaker, it's the Holy Spirit, and I'm asking you to respond to him today. Father, we love you and we honor you. And I'm so thankful that you give us the opportunity. You've called us today to this place on this day, on Mom's Day, Mother's Day, so that we could celebrate you. Jesus, would you change lives in here today? Holy Spirit, will you do the work that only you could do? Jesus, you sold us in John that if we would lift you up, when you are lifted up, you're speaking of the cross, when you are lifted up, you'll draw men and women, boys and girls to you. Today, we've tried to lift you up. We've lifted the cross, and now we're asking the Holy Spirit to save people. And it's in the name of Jesus I ask these things today. Amen. I'm going to ask all of you to stand up. Go ahead and do that now. I'm asking you to stand. This is the time that we respond. It's responding through singing, through maybe you need to pray with somebody. Turn and pray with them. Maybe you, listen, you don't know Jesus and you're going, I need to talk to somebody. I'm going to go out the doors. I'm going to be out at the next steps area. You'll see me. Come talk to me.
You're a guest. I want to meet you. Here's what I'm asking. I say this every week. The Holy Spirit brought you here. Don't run out on what it is that he desires for you today. He has brought you here to, for you to do a work with him today. Travis, why don't you lead us?